And what was the answer? Learn Bible. Find a pastor. I'm dead. I'm, I'm dead serious about this. You know, the pastor that I'm under and have been under my whole life um, was already the teacher for my college roommate. And as soon as I asked that question, I finally, you know, I asked everybody but her. And that took another, I don't know, month, two months. I finally asked her, and as soon as I asked her the question, that was the answer. And she happened to have a tape, and I listened to the tape, and as soon as I heard the voice of that guy, it was like, bingo, this is your teacher. Okay. It took me a month to get ready for that answer. Some people, it takes them years. We all fight the truth, and I'm no exception. It's just that I'm weaker than most people. I'm more of a, I don't know, jerk than most people. So my tolerance for pain and my tolerance for rebellion is a lot lower because I'm weaker. So I give in sooner. So I gave in. Oh, yeah, okay. I give up, God. <clears throat> What's the answer? Yeah, and as soon as I ask the question, finally, you know, for me it was a month, for other people it takes 10 years because they're stronger than me. Um, okay, this is my teacher. Of course, you know, like everybody else, I'd listen to the teacher and stop listening and listen and stop listening, and that went on for like 10 years. So I didn't learn much my first 10 years as a believer. So by the time I'm 25, 28, I think it was 28, actually. 27, 28. That's when I got serious. And I've already covered that part. I'm going through my own details because I don't know yours. And I'm really trying to show the pattern of how it works in the life. I'm something of a poster child. I have to be because I'm supposed to talk. This is how I learn. And God's going to apply... You know, show you the pattern of this speaker to your own life because your own life isn't much different. Yours is probably better. You're probably better a person than me. And being better has its problems. When you're stronger and better and smarter, you tend to um, use your own abilities more. Okay? So it's harder for you to switch over to God's abilities. I happen to be a jackass. So I switched to God's abilities real early on because one thing I have that that helps me switch is I'm real aware that I'm a jackass. I've been aware of that since I was a kid. All right? So I have a high intelligence. Yeah, whoopee, it doesn't do me any good. I'm still a jackass with a high intelligence about being a jackass. So I switch early. I switch fast. I have a low tolerance for pain, a low tolerance for discomfort, a low tolerance for things that go wrong. So I switch over to God real fast. And that's that's been what saved me. Not just, you know, for heaven, but saved me in my thinking. So I switched over at 18. Okay, but I kept, you know, I'd listen to the Bible and then I'd stop. And I'd go off and do something else. Then I'd get punished and I'd come back to the Bible. Come, and I always knew it was my teacher. There was just no doubt in my mind. When he hit me that first time when I was 18, I knew this is my teacher and this isn't somebody else. Okay, but that didn't mean I listened to the teacher for the first 10 years. Okay, you with me on that? That's typical of the problem of the spiritual life. Is we finally get the gospel... And A, either we're immediately drawn into apostasy and we stay there X period of time. My stay in apostasy was very short, only because I have a very low tolerance. All right? But some people stay in apostasy for years, their whole life, and they never figure it out. Okay? When you start to question whether the system that you learned about God is valid, that's when God starts hitting you with the answers. In my case, it happened within a month. In some people's cases, they don't ask the question. They assume that they're in the right thing. 
But if it's wrong, it doesn't make sense. But if you don't want to look at that question, you won't. And then God is not going to hit you. I mean, he's hitting you, but it's never going to penetrate. So something bad has to happen to you before you start the question. And a lot of people who are Christians, who became atheists, that's how they went. They were in an apostate learning thing to start with. They believed in Christ, but they immediately got into apostasy. The apostasy eventually showed itself up for being the jackass thing that it was. And instead of just questioning, am I in the right place? version of interpreting the Bible, they just threw out God with, you know, baby with the bath water. They threw out God, the Bible, everything. Because they didn't really accept the idea that what they were learning from their parents or whoever led them to the Lord was wrong. In other words, they didn't come to the conclusion that God is right, but I, these people are wrong. They lumped God and the people together as if that was the only version of the facts. So they became atheists. That's true of the Muslims, too. The Muslims who, you know, Islam we know is false in any flavor. But the fact is that people get into Islam, too. Just like they get into Christianity. Because they have this epiphany about God. They want God. And they get fed a false idea of God. And then when that falseness eventually proves itself to be corrupt as it always does, they throw out God with the falseness, never thinking that, you know, there could be some other version of God which is correct, but this one is not. And then they stay mad at God for a long time until some more bad stuff happens to them. And then maybe they'll wake up and smell the coffee. But that's the story of your average Muslim, your average Christian, your average, name your religion. Okay? 99.9% of it is all apostate false information mixed with some truths. Like even the one truth about Islam is that God does exist. They get everything else wrong, but they're right that there is a God. Alright? And every other religion on the planet has some idea of God, which has got maybe, you know, one dot or two dots that are true, and all the rest of it is false. In Christianity, it's like, you know, maybe a hundred dots or two hundred dots of truth. And all the rest of it's false. It depends on the denomination. So the point is, is that we all go through, we are given the gospel at some point, we believe it correctly and are truly saved. But almost immediately afterwards, we go down the rabbit hole with Alice And we start learning all these falsehoods and we're too dumb to live. We don't know that they're false. So what God has to do, he keeps alerting us the nice way. But we won't hear that. He knows that we won't hear that. So sooner or later he has to smack us upside down the head. And of course the stronger you are and the more it matters to you that the people around you who believe the falsehood, the more you're going to try and fight the alert that you're getting through bad circumstances or just it's hitting your head, you're going to fight it. You're going to want to preserve the lies you've come to love and believe, either because you care about the people around you, or you want to fit in, or you're just plain stubborn. And if you stick that way long enough, God will stop warning you. And your life will actually become nice for a while. Because there's no point in spanking you. You won't listen even if you're spanked. You'll think yourself holy and suffering for God. So he's not going to authorize spanking for you. You're already being spanked by believing the falsehood. That's why so many Christians who are apostate are successful. On the one hand, there's no point in spanking them because they're not going to learn. God doesn't spank you in order to hurt you. He spanks you in order to teach. He blesses you when he spanks you. He blesses you when he gives you nice things. But they're both designed to teach. Okay, so it's a question of what teaches you. And if it's not going to teach you, okay, hands off. 
God doesn't violate volition. On the other hand, you got Satan who's busy promoting every falsehood he can. Satan's the author of religion, not God. And every falsehood, man, he loves linking up the King James only people to the true gospel. The gospel is really cracked. Okay? And he can't stop it from being promulgated. But the next best thing he can do is to undercut the very Bible it's written in. Because the King James only people are out to destroy the very Bible. They say that the words that Jesus learned and spoke are not available to you, that they're corrupt. Until 1611 when God finally got it right. Every single King James only person is as satanic as it gets. They will be at the very bottom of God's kingdom. I mean, I have to assume that, that God's kingdom has a lot of rote workers in it because billions and billions of Christians are going to be there at the bottom because they've been lying about God their whole lives. Now, a drunk in Calcutta can say the gospel right. And he's still drunk in Calcutta. Just because he can mouth the right words doesn't mean he's any good. Doesn't mean that, his, that, that he's not apostate. The same thing with the King James only person. He, a lot of them can spout the gospel correctly. But they are as satanic as it comes. The one thing Satan can't stop them from doing, although he makes inroads, even there, is he can't stop all of them from saying the gospel correctly. But he's making very serious inroads. I mean, Peter Ruckman is a King James only pimp. And he teaches that during the tribulation, the Jews have to work for salvation. So his believe only gospel to be saved is completely corrupted. And he's anti-Semitic as it comes. They all are. K King James only movement is entirely anti-Semitic. Hidden. Very sophisticated. They undercut the entire Bible, which was entirely written by Jews, by saying it's entirely corrupt. And they have all kinds of really weird arguments they come up with for that that are totally laughable. And I did 72 videos proving why those arguments of theirs are completely wrong and lies. So... You know, if you're a masochist, go listen. The point is, is that apostate people, like the King James only people, there is a, a certain lesser degree of apostasy in every other denomination, like Calvinism and Catholicism. But every one of them gets something right. So it's like 1% to 10% right, and 90% to 99% lies. And we all get sucked into these people when we're first born again. We all go this route. And the route divorces the thinking and learning of Christ from what you do in your own life. They're presented as two different things and it's what you do with your body that's emphasized. In the King James Only movement, in Catholicism and Calvinism, they all stress stuff you got to do. They themselves cannot communicate the Bible on any sophisticated level whatsoever. They parrot. They go to, if in fact, the direct reading, the actual direct interpretation and reading of Scripture is not their strong point. They go to go-betweens. They all have their little celebrities, their so-called teachers, and their celebrities that they hawk. And you're always reading some third party and never actually learning the scripture itself. That's the second hallmark. So there's a distancing between you and Bible, between you and learning Christ, because Christ's thinking is the Bible. Old Testament is his thinking as God. New Testament is his thinking as human. And you need the mainline Bible to learn it. And you're not mainlining Bible if you're reading a translation. You need to learn it the way Christ learned it. Christ didn't learn it in English. He learned it in Hebrew and Greek. And so must you. If you're going to be Christ-like, you got to do what Christ did. You don't want to be Christ-like? then you don't do what Christ did. And if you don't do what Christ did, you're not learning Christ. And to the extent you're not learning Christ, you're learning apostasy instead. It's that simple. 
Christ-like means to be like Christ. If you're going to be like Christ, WWJD, what did Jesus do? He learned Bible in Hebrew and Greek. He didn't learn it in English because it didn't exist. So are you doing that? If not, then you're not Christ-like. You're not doing what Jesus did. And what didn't Jesus do? He didn't run around five minutes after he was born, even though obviously he had supernatural power and could quote scripture. He didn't run around five minutes after he was born. Soul winning. He didn't clean pews. He didn't put money in the collection plate. He didn't scream, Oh, how I love God. He sat and learned for 30 years. He didn't do anything for 30 years at all. So why aren't we being Christ-like and doing what Jesus did? When you're born again, you don't do anything. You'll learn. When you're a baby in the cradle, you're not doing anything but pooping in your diapers, which somebody else has to put on you. So the only thing you output, the only thing you do, is doo-doo. Everything else is coming into you from somebody else. And the only thing you can do is doo-doo, and somebody has to clean that up. Same thing in the spiritual life. When you're born again, you know nothing. So what do you do? Do do. That's all you can do. You can't do anything else. And hello, Christ for 30 years didn't do anything. He learned, he learned, he learned, he learned. And he didn't even get tested until he was 30. Matthew 4. As the, you know, prelude to his beginning to do something, his ministry started after he went out in the wilderness for the 40 days and 40 nights. Not before. So how come we aren't following his example? So what was he really doing during the 30 years? Learning, 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 learning. You'll notice in Matthew 4, when Satan's talking to him, that every single thing that he says in reply is a Bible reply. First temptation, Satan says, Oh, do something with your body. Turn these stones into bread after all. You're God. That's first class condition in the Greek. Yes, and it's true, you're God. So use your God power. Why are you going hungry? You can turn a stone into bread. And by the way, you can turn all the stones into bread and feed the whole world after all your God. Why aren't you doing that? Sly, sly, sly. You should be doing that, God, if you really love creation. Why are you letting them go hungry? You know, Satan was trying to bait Christ to get him angry, so he'd use his God power to zap Satan out of existence. Christ replies, what? Deuteronomy 8.3, you're going to live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Not bread only. Ding, 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 ding. He is associating again, like he did at birth, God vertical with the horizontal, joined, not separated. In other words, whatever you're doing with the body has to first be joined to the word. Or what the heck do you know to do with your body? So that's what he did for 30 years that we don't do. He spent 30 years learning the word. So he'd know what to do with his body. How come Christians aren't teaching that? If a Christian really knew the Bible... The minute, let's say, let's say I was giving you the gospel, and I'll do it right now. Here, are you sure you're saved? If not, believe Christ paid for your sins and you're saved forever. Okay, let's say you say, I believe Christ paid for my sins. Okay, fine, you're going to heaven now. And then you say to me, well, now what, brain out? Here's what. Ask God who is your pastor, teacher. And just sit and learn Bible. And you say, well, what do I do with myself? 
do nothing but learn. Now, when I say do nothing but learn, that doesn't mean that you go off on a, you know, like the stupid hermit idea. It doesn't mean you go off into the wilderness somewhere and sit on a bench. Of course, you can't do that if you need a pastor. Because that means you have to have a car. You have to have a place to live. You have to have stuff to eat. You have to have a job. You have to have time. And that requires a lot of doing on your part. Okay? There's a lot of doing there. It's not works. It's staying alive. That's not works. That's staying alive. What you got to do to go to the store. Cost of doing business. Your life is about getting the word in your head. That's it. Okay, but in order to get the word in your head, you got all these other things that are cost of doing business so you can get the word in your head. To get the word in your head, you have to be alive. To get the word in your head, you have to eat, you have to pee, you have to wear clothes. You have to pay your bills, which means you have to work. And whether you're going to travel to Bible class in a Maserati or a bicycle, well, all that's up to God and He's already given you a job, a place to live, clothes, transportation, a family, and you've all got you've already got right now, right this second, all kinds of little, you know, obligations and benefits that he gave you. Whatever it is you got right now, that's what he gave you. And now the question is, okay, how do I marshal these things so I get enough time to to get under the pastor or whoever God's assigned me to and just start learning. And you're not going to be doing the learning 24/7. You're gonna be. You're gonna learn maybe an hour a day. Don't overdo it. And the other 23 hours a day, you get to try to practice what you learn on everything else you do. That's it. That's the whole spiritual life right there. That's the entire procedure right there. So, let's say if it happens to you like it did for me, you say, "Okay, God, who's my pastor?" And within a month or less. He makes it clear to you who your pastor is. So now you know where to take your car. You know how to marshal your time. Because the pastor's got his own location. Maybe he's online. So it's more easy for you to get the stuff. You know. So now you have to plan your day. But if he's someplace physical, then you got to figure out your transport issues and all that other stuff. But you get into some kind of a, of a schedule. All right, so you're listening for your one hour a day one way or the other, and all the costs of going there if you have to physically go. And then the other 23 hours a day, eight of which you hopefully sleep, and the doctrine will be in your head while you sleep, eventually. Okay, so let's say today's class in Bible class was about Samson and Delilah. It just flew into my head. I have no idea what I'm going to say next. Okay, what was the story about Samson and Delilah? Well, Samson had this long hair. He was dedicated to God from birth. Okay, he was a judge of Israel. You really have no idea what all those words mean. You're just recalling facts like I'm doing now because I haven't thought about this in years. Well, what was that about? Well, Delilah basically, she was she was this like car lady who Samson fell in love with, and she eventually convinced him to to tell him her secret, her him his secret, so that she could denude him of his power, which was to cut his hair because it was Nazarite. Okay, how do you use a story that happened three thousand years ago? To two people you never met, in a technological age, you have absolutely no idea what it was actually like to live then. How does that relate to you having to get on the internet, pay your bills, feed your kids, or whatever else it is you have to do? How does that relate? Well, ask God that question. 
Okay, Dad, I, okay, you taught me about Samson and Delilah today. Some of it I knew already, some of it I didn't know. And it seems as completely unrelated to my life right now as it could be. So where does it relate? i got to do an email. I have to go to the bathroom. I have to eat supper. How does any of this relate to what I learned in Bible class? Now, for a lot of it, you're not going to know the answer right away. But you got to ask the question. Get in the habit of asking the question. Because if you ask the question, you're asking for the linkage, the merge, the association between God and your horizontal life. Matthew 4, 4. You're not living on bread only. You're living on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay, out of the mouth of God today, as far as you're concerned, was a lesson about Samson and Delilah. You got it today. You didn't get it yesterday. You didn't get it two weeks ago. You might be getting it a month from now, but that hasn't happened yet. So why'd you get it today? Why didn't you get it yesterday? What's the message in the message that applies to you today? Something does. God foreknew billions of years ago that today you'd get that lesson on Samson and Delilah. He also knew that you would ask. By asking, you are joining the Bible to your horizontal life, which seems totally unrelated. So you're doing the same thing Christ did. Get this? Christ joined Bible to his body at birth, Hebrews 10.5. Christ joined body and Bible in Matthew 4.4. So you're now joining body and Bible, the only way you know how, by asking the question, Okay, Dan, what the heck? Does Samson and Delilah's story today in Bible class have to do with my life today, right now, with what I have to do with it? You're hearing me think. How do I use this information so it's going to please you? And what is it doing? You didn't write it for nothing. I didn't learn this for nothing. You have a plan about why I learned this today. See how much Bible you're using just to analyze the question? Before you even know the answer. This isn't, what I'm saying to you isn't something you couldn't think up on your own. You're just not doing it. I don't do it enough either. I'm just as guilty as everybody else, okay? I'm also trying to buy time because I'm not 100% sure what I'm supposed to say about Samson and Delilah. Except this one thought that hit my mind. To, to, you know, fast forward, you got the point. Now let's talk about how does it relate. Samson was given power by God. He was given a job by God. And then everybody else was trying to stop him from doing his job that God gave him. Samson himself had a lot of, shall we call it, predilections for the ladies. He was obviously cute. He appealed to them. They appealed to him. You know, he got into the whole story because he wanted a girl he wasn't supposed to want. And then that didn't work out properly, so he ended up slaying a whole bunch of people who were related to the girl. Okay. And that didn't work out. So along come other girls. And they're all looking to defeat Samson. Because why? Samson is demonstrating God's power. He's got a supernatural strength that everybody recognizes because humans don't have that much power. Must be coming from God. And it's not Dagon. Dagon was the competing God. And so they were jealous That the God of Israel was showing up to be more powerful than their God. You know, understand that these people were like two years old mentally. 
To them, it was all about brute force in the body. So God caters, as it were, to their childish notions and talks to them in the language that they know, that of brute strength. So he gives Samson all this brute strength to keep them from, you know, attacking Israel because that's what the judge's job was in the book of Judges. That's where all this occurs. Is to keep your hands off Israel. Because there's this God behind Israel who's going to beat you up if you try to beat up the Jews. And so Samson was the poster boy at that time. And God gave him brute strength because that's all that the Philistines, you know, would admit to. That's the only thing they recognized. You know, when you're talking to a criminal mind or a childish mind, you have to talk to them in their own terms. And pain and suffering and strength is what they understand that's their language so God talked to them in their language using Samson so they were afraid and they were angry and they were jealous but what's the heart of it God did something to Samson Samson wasn't doing it on his own power It looked like Samson's power because it's a physical thing. But it was God doing it to Samson. That was the advertisement atop the physical thing. Bing, 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 bing. God's power joined to the body. Same message as Hebrews 10.5 and Matthew 4.4. Not only the body but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God with the proceeding and the mouth of God first God's power is through God's word God's word first and what's the story of Samson and Delilah? Samson gave up on God Samson rejected the source of his power in favor of a woman who coaxed it out of him And, of course, we saw the punishment that Samson incurred. Okay, so the first thing you can apply to today from the Samson and Delilah story is, Hello, whose power am I living on? God's or my own? And am I giving up God's power that could be pouring into me, into whatever I'm doing, whether I'm doing the dishes or writing an email Or, you know, slam dunking in racquetball. Do I want to do it on God's power or my own? Or am I going to give in to the temptation by something outside because I want that something outside? You know, in this case, Samson wanted the woman's approval. Oh, Samson, you don't love me if you don't tell me your secret. How many times do we give in to stuff like that? We don't necessarily have a secret to tell. And cutting our hair won't do any good. But we give in to things. Oh, you're just doing that by... Here's a real good example of an application. Oh, you're just going to study Bible? How come you don't come out with us and do some soul winning? Winning souls for Satan, not Christ. Even if you say the gospel correctly, yeah, they might believe in Christ, but they immediately go into Satan's camp. Because they're as stupid as you, thinking that you can win a soul. Come on, you should come out with us. Instead of studying Bible, you should, man, and just making yourself feel smart because you know the Greek and Hebrew and the verses. That's all you're doing is you're doing it for ego. That's not, that's not helping people. You should come out and knock on doors and give the gospel like we're doing. That's a Delilah temptation. In order to fit in with Delilah, he tells her his secret. In order to fit in with those lousy, lying, satanic, allegedly soul-winning people, you put down your Bible and you go with them. 